What an honor it is to be here. Um, this is the, my Sunday school class right here. So every Sunday I stand right here and I'm the MC and um, it's a Sunday school class that I, without shame, <laughs> say it is the greatest Sunday school class in the universe. <laughs> and uh, so started with six couples back in 1978 and it's still going. So um, thank you for coming tonight. I, I, there's so much going on through my mind, but I just want to start with this. Why is this important to a certain degree? I was sharing with Pastor Carter. There's a research study showing that as few as three, one and a half hour parenting sessions with, will make a difference in their parenting style, pre and post measures. That's fascinating to me um, because there is no other single institution that has more impact on our society than parenting. And so this is, this is a joy to be here. Um, and, and so I'm a, I'm a professor, I'm a teacher, I'm not a preacher, as you'll find out real soon. And so if you have questions, just jump in right away, okay? I, I just don't wait. Um, this, is, this is about you. You all have copies if you need them. If you want electronic copies, I'll be glad to send them to you. So here's, this is what we're doing for four weeks. Tonight we're doing parenting with a mission. What's the end goal? Next week, what does parenting with guilt and shame look like? We know what it feels like in some sense, but what does it look like? Then the third week, how to successfully discipline without using punishment and, and shaming strategies. Discipline, the style of discipline, is probably the number one thing parents use to shape a child's development, bar none. So we're going to look at that in a very in-depth way. And then the last one, four weeks from now, or three weeks from now, we're going to put it all together, five keys to successful parenting that kind of, I'm a numbers guy, and so I'm used borrowings from Doc Dobbins' uh, material, and, and uh, so that's what we want to do. And, and I know it's been recorded, so if you miss a week, please get the recording so that you can be there the next week. So who am I? How did I get here? I'm a missionary kid, grew up in Africa. Um, I was in boarding school, age six, first time, first grade. I spent more times in boarding school than I did with my parents. Just the nature of what it was back in the 60s and 70s. Um, it, it did shape my life, absolutely. Um, I'm grateful my parents were missionaries, Marge and Ernie Jones. Grandparents Harold and Margaret Jones were missionaries. My other side, Gladys and Maynard Ketchum were missionaries. I just found out recently that Maynard Ketchum was being considered to being the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God. I didn't know that until a month, two months ago. So there's some new information there. But, so that's, yeah, my life would have been totally changed probably if he was, you know, the general superintendent. But anyway, welcome folks. And so, went to Evangel University on a soccer scholarship because I want to play soccer. Who cares about school, right? And then my, Dr. Glenn Burnett was my advisor. He said, Grant, you know, you got to get declare a major. Really? Soccer's not a major? <laughs> I thought it was. And so I declared a math major because it came easy. Um, my Halfway through my junior year, I realized psychology is where I need to be. If I'm going to be working with people, the Lord spoke to me one of the few times in an intro to psych class. He said, Grant, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the answer was, Lord, I, I want to work with people. And then he said, well, why don't you have a psych degree? So I got a psych major in three semesters. Got a master's degree in counseling. And then I got a psychology, a PhD in counseling psych, psychologist at the University of Missouri, Columbia. I've been at Evangel since 1988 until last year. I have a private practice, Gateway Counseling Center, and just honored to be able to serve the Lord in this capacity. I'm just, uh, just every day, it's a neat to realize that the Lord is using me in an area where in the 70s and 80s, if you're going to psychology, you were considered kind of on the dark side. You weren't accepted. Now it's a little, quite a bit different now, and so I'm grateful that the field has changed in a great degree. So, 
I'm married, have two sons, two daughter-in-laws, and three grand, three and a half grandkids. So the other, the last one comes this October. I'll show you a picture of them here in a moment. And I am Babu, by the way. That's my name. It's Swahili for grandpa. And so, why such an emphasis on shame? Simple. There is no single construct more critical in the development of mental illness than toxic shame, bar none. Whether it's depression, anxiety, PTSD, DID, borderline, all of those have a substrate of shame, period. Um, and, and next week we're going to dive into what is shame. I'll do a, a, a little bit, maybe I'll have a little time today, but it, it is the quintessential, um, well, Clint uh, Thompson says it is the force of Satan. It was there in the garden, and that's what motivated Eve. What do you mean you're not as good as God? And so he firmly believes that toxic shame is indeed a force that Satan uses to keep us from being who Christ wants us to be. Um, what I hope will happen is you will walk away with really neat skills, not just some head knowledge, but something that you can apply to your life immediately, regardless of the age of your children or your grandchildren. I'm in that process now, and it's really neat to, I mean, it is interesting to see how my sons are parenting. Um, you really don't know if you're a good parent until your grandkids, how they turn out will determine whether you're a decent parent or not. So I thought I was out of the hook, off the hook, both my boys. No, I gotta, I gotta wait a little while longer um, to see how my grandkids turn out. Oh, oh, and here's some evidence. You know, we talk about, well, where's the proof <laughs> of what you have to say? Where, you know, if you, someone's doing financial planning and he, you know, comes or she comes with a beat up car and t taggy clothes, you say, well, ee. but here's my proof, okay? Th this, is, this is my family. <clears throat> um, this is about two years ago. Cameron, did this not work? It did. Cameron over here is a attorney at law, elder law, financial planner. Um, his wife, Kayla, is an incredible, um, what would you call it, uh, um, advert, advertisement guru. She had like Smuckers and Starbucks and she was one of those for a while there. Uh, now she works with another company that's marketing Bible applications. This is my oldest son, Ryan. He's a neuropsychologist in the Cox Neurology Department on the sixth floor. Um, and then Mary is a social worker, uh, graduated from Evangel's program. In fact, not many people can say this, that all their kids and their step kids all were in my class at one time. <laughs> they were all my students at some point. And, and it, it, is, it is so neat to be able to, 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 to say that. So, what is your mission statement? Wherever you work, does your company have a mission statement? Any of you work at a company that there's no mission statement? Evangel has a mission. Why do we have mission statements? It gives direction. Gives direction. Purpose, meaning, why you exist, where you hope to go. Dr. Taylor at Evangel University, she was always saying what our mission statement was. It defines everything. When you go for accreditation, you have to document <laughs> that you are meeting your mission statement. So what's your mission statement in parenting? How many of you have one? Well, your assignment at the end of today is by next week, you are to have a mission statement, parenting mission statement, and I will Share mine, but not today. <laughs> what are your end goals for your children? What do you want them to turn out to be? 
How will you know if you've been successful? What is your parenting plan? What is your model? How do you articulate that? How do you define that? How many of you want to parent like your parents did? Raise your hand. Exactly. Exactly. Some will go like this. Why? What parenting model did they use? The 70s one. The 70s one. <laughs> there you go. It's the most significant institution, and we have the least amount of emphasis in training and preparation. In fact, I have a slide later on, doing the opposite of what your parents did is still not a decent parenting plan. <laughs> yeah. What training have you had in parenting? Remember, how many did I say, if you do how many, you will change your parenting model? Or, well, as th three times, yeah. that's right. So in four weeks, we got that covered. It's, it makes, it'll make, your, your kids will love you for this parenting series. They will. At first, they may get a little upset with you, especially when you start setting some boundaries and consequences, but that's all right. If you have parenting goals, how are you going to get there? What is your path? What's your plan? Did my parents have a parenting plan? No, I have no clue. Plus, being in boarding school, <laughs> hey. and it was kind of nice, because when I come home from boarding school, there was kind of like this honeymoon phase. They didn't want to, you know, lower the hammer and, and let's just have a good time, and then when they started getting tired of us, it was back to boarding school. It worked. Um, do I recommend that? I probably would do it again, you know. It's kingdom work, and you, but there are ways in which you can do that. My wife, and I, my wife is a missionary kid, so we've had this conversation. Uh, would we do it again the way we did it? And we probably, well, we're not sure. There are causes, and, and this is the part that's hard for me, that's not hard for me to say. When you are a believer and Christ is your Lord, it does take away some of your options. And so, both Rita and I knew the Lord had called our parents in fantastic ways. And we could have, they, you can still be a great missionary and still be a decent parent. It's not an either or. Not an either or. And what you have to do, and I'm sidebarring here, is we, you have to be careful that if a child has anger towards their mom and dad in ministry, that they don't project that onto God. Because it could be, you know, just because you're a Christian doesn't automatically make you a good parent. Any more than becoming a Christian makes you a great mechanic or a great artist or a great physician. They all require training. Training. So... The goals of parenting that I am putting on here are research-based, all right? Um, and so I'm not just pulling these out of the air. There is research showing that each of these are predictor variables of healthy adulthood. So if you, this is, these are my end goals. This is what I personally worked on with my two boys, okay? Number one, a religious matrix. This comes from secular Research, okay? These, these first three for sure. These, were the, these first three were the, best, the biggest predictors of healthy adulthood and it differentiated between delinquency and non-delinquency children. So these three, religious matrix, sense of discipline, respect for authority, social skills. What do you think? Well, you all can read, so identity psychologically healthy, and career achievement motivation. So let me unpack each of these, and, and we'll come back to them in a little greater detail down the road. All right. Regardless, regardless of the religion, okay, 
whether it be Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, Catholicism, those young adults with a religious matrix are much more successful as adults. Why? It answers the existential questions, the big questions. Why are we here? What is our purpose? Where are we going? What is the meaning of life? And a religious matrix really answers some of those questions. And so those individuals tend to be, as a group, healthier as adults than those that did not have a religious matrix. I'm reminded <clears throat> of, of scripture that says, train up a, a child, I don't can't even say it, in his youth, and he will not depart from that training. Um, that always struck me as interesting because I know some kids that were exposed to great things as kids, and nowadays they're not following the Lord, but that pattern is still, the, the, that foundation is there, um, t tugging at them. <clears throat> So, religious matrix. All right. So what are we doing to do that? Bringing our children to church. And not just bringing them to church, like the pastor said last Sunday, but we're actually living it out. It's not just ritual. I am very disheartened with where our movement is going in its view of Sunday school. If we're just relying on main service to be our Bible teaching, we are in a heap of hurt. One study I came across in Great Britain, 54, 55% of the sample believed Harry Potter was in the Bible. I kid you not. Doesn't surprise me if you're not teaching it in Sunday school. So I, I'm, I'm big into Sunday school. I, I mean, you can't ask the pastor to teach everything for everybody. It just doesn't work that way. And so, um, sense of discipline, self-regulation, um, the ability to self-regulate, self-govern are key skills related to successful adulthood. How you manage your time, your money, your resources, your relationship, um, school success and even sexual purity is related to the ability to have a sense of discipline. Can I delay gratification? Can we teach children how to delay gratification? And the answer is yes. It's painful, especially if we don't follow it ourselves. Um, and the credit card has had a difficult Credit card does not help with delay gratification. Does not. And I'm not saying get rid of your credit cards, but I'm just saying it doesn't help with that. Respect for authority. Of the top three that I've just mentioned that separated delinquent children from non-delinquent is this respect for authority. This includes teachers, law enforcement officers, the elderly principals, clergy, and on and on. There was a time, and maybe some of you, if we ever messed up with a teacher or got in trouble at school, then when we got home, it didn't go well for us. I don't know if that's the case anymore. I think teachers are really fearful of students nowadays. They do not have a respect for authority because it has not been taught in the home. And when someone says, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, we're kind of taken back on that, aren't we? But it, it's, it, the military do a good job of that. But it, beyond that, it's just we somehow, can we teach our children to respect authority? And the answer is absolutely, absolutely. So social skills of all the developmental domains, academics, spiritual, emotional, moral, career development, the most significant of that domain are social skills. Can you think of a domain where social skills are not important? I guess if you hibernate in a computer somewhere in your computer program, maybe. But you had to go to class in some sense. But teaching children how to get along with other people, how to be respectful, how to share, how to take turns, 
how to honor, how to not be in the front of the line. Those are all things we as parents can teach children to do that. What's interesting is my, the Mary, the social worker, takes her two kids and they do volunteer work somewhere once a month. Uh, lost and found. Um, they actually <laughs> have a, a couple of times they've had like a lemonade stand and they will say the profits of this go to lost and found. Love it. Absolutely love it. She puts me to shame. So identity. This is the key developmental task for adolescents. Who am I? What do I believe? Where am I going? And this is triggered by a physiological change in the brain. And that is the co they go from concrete level thinking to formal level thinking. So that's why adolescence is different. It's not just the change in the brain, but it's the change in puberty, change in body sh shape, style. And this is who am I? What do I believe? What is my purpose, my goal? Those with, those with a secure identity have less mental health issues, less delinquency and antisocial behaviors, more likely to avoid joining destructive peer groups, behaviors, and drugs, and are more likely to engage in pro-social behaviors, setting healthy sexual boundaries, more likely to help others, and achieve a greater academic advancement. All predicated on how secure is your child's identity. It is much more difficult today because of culture, gender identity, things like it's confusing. Um, but nonetheless, we as parents, we can help shape that. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about in, in this kind of our series here. Goes without saying, the healthier child is, the healthier it'll affect all their other domains. The one that really gets me. I mean, I, I had a goal. I was very deliberate. I wanted both my boys to be virgins when they got married. That was intentional. We talked about it. We addressed it at the dinner table, gave them material, and I'll share that material with you later on. Outstanding from the Concordia uh, Publishing Company. But the more I believe they would be healthy, the more likely they would be able to take care of themselves. And this is where I wanted them to have a great identity. I knew that they were loved by mom and dad, loved by the Lord, and, and we trusted them and respected them. And so this, those that are healthier will make wiser choices, have healthier boundaries, and will make career choices, make some changes, some plans and where they're going to go. This is, how many have heard of self-efficacy? We've heard of self-esteem, self-worth, self-value, but self-efficacy is? How effective you think you are with what you're, what you're choosing to do. Right. And it's along the lines of, do I believe I can do it? Am I capable of doing it? And how well can I do it? That is a greater predictability than intelligence or IQ when it comes to academic forms. If the child person believes I can do this, then the more likely they will do it. And a person that says I can't do it, learned helplessness, what are they going to do? I'm not even going to try. This is a huge predictor and we can teach our kids to be more self-efficacious. Absolutely. Um, those are huge and a positive self-regard. Huge predictors. And the last one, this, again, this is your end goal. What do, what do I want my kid when he or she walks the line at 18 and moves on? Is he or she ready to handle life on her own or his own? Right. Were you ready at 18? Mine was 17. <laughs> and when I came to Evangel. Um, to me, it was no big deal. I've been doing it since first grade. <laughs> you just do it. Um, but I remember some of my buddies were struggling with it. It's the first time they were away from home. And it was tough for some of them. But anyway, knowing what one wants to do in life as well as fostering 
intrinsic motivation, I'm sorry, I'm using a lot of terminology, but intrinsic motivation is you're doing, the motivation is doing the behavior because it's something you enjoy or want to do. It comes from inside you. Huge, huge, huge predictor of behavior. In fact, you, we can actually see the difference between your view of God, whether you're intrinsically motivated or extrinsically motivated. If you're intrinsically motivated, you serve the Lord because of what He's done for you and you want to honor Him. Extrinsic motivation, you serve God because you expect Him to bless you and reward you and provide and take care of you. Totally different. Discipline that I would share with you starting next week or in the week after is how you discipline will actually increase intrinsic motivation or extrinsic motivation. Just how you discipline. Huge. Huge. <laughs> now for our commercial. <laughs> I love it. That's, that's prettier than my stuff, that's for sure. Now, they are also negatively correlated with depression, anxiety, and drug usage. Huge. So, that's why I put this, the, the, uh, hopefully right away you're starting to think, okay, how do I now put this, <laughs> this is my goal, how do I start getting there? And, and that, those are valid, valid questions. And, and we're going to get there. We really are. Um, so, any questions on that before I go any farther? Oh, I gotta stay around here because I'm being recorded. Questions so far? Comments, reactions, come on. <laughs> Talk to me. I'm gonna get a drink. Make sense? Confusing? Okay, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> I promise. <clears throat> All right, the next thing I want to do is cover the, what we believe are the basic four parenting styles. They can all be subsumed under these four categories. Diane Baumride was one of the first ones to do this kind of research. She worked with nursery kids and elementary, and then it's expanded to other people. And so really, this is kind of gospel. It, it, it has been replicated many times, and, and you'll be able to see where, you, where your parenting style is or what you used to use um, in these four. And so... The field uses the word authoritarian and authoritative. Those get so confusing to me, don't they? And so that's why I go autocratic, democratic. That's how I differentiate those two. Then there's the permissive, laissez-faire, and then there's the neglectful, I guess, is the more recent one that's come out. And basically it's just absent, just not there. So what I want to do is I'm going to share some of Diane's research and, and go through each of these. And, and by the way, uh, Doc Dobbins, uh, Dare to Discipline, things like that. He, he, he endo I mean, he's got some r neat research looking at this stuff as well and, and showing that these indeed are, are uh, he's not legitimizing them, but he's showing that two of these are not good for a believer to use in parenting and one clearly is better. And both Baumride and, and Doc Dobbins say the same thing, right? And it's, it's pretty straightforward. I want to say right before I go any farther, you should use all four at some point in your parent. If you're going to be a good parent, you will be able to use all four when it is necessary. Yes. To say I'm going to stick with one all of their 18 years, that is not healthy. One size does not fit all. You've got to take in the developmental stages of each child. So if you have a three-year-old and a 13-year-old, they are different. Even though they have the same DNA background and they have to be treated differently. They have to be parented differently. And to try to treat every kid the same 
I know that sounds good. It's really not wise. It's not wise. Now you try to, if you have those develop, we bought the bicycle this time, or we bought the trampoline this time, or we bought the, the BB gun at this time. Yeah, try to keep that same time frame. But I have Cameron and Ryan, if I use the same parenting style on both, we would be in deep doo-doo. Um, they just, they respond to different, we'll talk about that. When discipline, discipline has to hurt and it hurts different ways for different kids. And that's what you gotta find out what really hurts and then use that as your discipline approach. So let me go forward here. All right, so this, this is kind of like a quick overview. Um, and we've got two dimensions, demandingness and responsiveness. I just go straight to the, the authoritative or what we call what? The democratic is clearly front and center the preferred choice. There's some really good research and I'll show you that here in a moment, how effective that, whether religious, spiritual, it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm gonna break this down, we're gonna go through each one, but authoritative basically is you, the parents are still in authority, but they involve the decisions of the children, their opinions. Like for instance, we had five rules posted on the fridge and we would negotiate what those five rules were. And then we would negotiate what the consequences of those rules. Now I was, Rita and I were still in charge, but they had a bearing into, we have the rules, now you decide the consequences when you violate those rules. That is what they would say an authoritative. We're still in charge, but we're gonna involve you, we're gonna respect you enough to have ownership in the game. And then we would come back. If we had to renegotiate, we would renegotiate. We'd have a family meeting, okay, now, Dad, I don't, Mom, I don't, can we change this? Okay, why? And then we'd have that conversation. Um, the rules are clear. The expectations are clear. But it's not iron-fisted. Whereas the authoritarian is king, dad, queen, mom. And the rest are just, we know what's best for you, and you just do it. There's a lot of parents that could have been the Nike spokesperson. Just do what I tell you to do. Don't ask questions. Don't challenge. Don't question. We know what's best for you. Disaster. Because it doesn't teach what in the child. Just, just real quickly, what does that not teach in the children that we've talked about with those first seven? Doesn't teach independence? Ownership. Ownership. That's a big one there. It doesn't teach self-regulation or self-discipline. Why should I make it? I just, mom and dad make the decision. I don't have to make it for myself. Just a lot. And then it conveys the message, you're just not capable enough or good enough to know what's best for you. You see the shaming part that goes in there? The permissive was out of the 70s and 80s, I think. Um, and it has a, a notion that comes out of humanistic theory that a person knows what? Best for him or her. The answer is within. The, the children are automatically inherently good and it's society that corrupts them. So we just as parents need to let those natural things emerge. It sounds good, but it isn't good. Because we all know, any of you have had children, mm, they don't always act nice and good. In fact, if you look at Erickson's model, they're, they're very selfish here in that first two or three years. This is mine. Don't you dare try to take this away from me. So, but, 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 this is the model probably you should use when in the child's development. Well, when, when they are launching into adulthood, they need to have 
they need to make their own mistakes. And yes. So we need to do some of that. So junior and senior, you give them a little bit, you give them quite a bit more autonomy, independence, and, and, and regulation. Yes. You they take that because they get their car. Pardon me? <laughs> they take that up on me because they now have a car. Yeah. And that's a, they they, they're, it's a huge, I, I've said this, and I still say it, I mean, once they hit 10th grade, your parenting pretty much is done. It's, 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 you've got until they get the car, <laughs> basically, to do what you need to do. Because it's basically junior and senior year, it's fine tuning. They have already switched to getting more influence and opinion from their peers than from their parents. Now, what's beautiful is they don't totally, they will ignore parental wisdom. The, the big picture, they still go back to mom and dad. But the day-to-day -day stuff, they will go to their peers. And that's kind of a normal thing. And neglectful, uninvolved, absent, no nutri nutrients, no guidance. I hate, I mean, this has been added in the last 20, 15 years because of what we've seen happen in our culture and society. Okay, questions on this? Now I'm just going to go through some of these just to show you what, we're, what we mean by it, okay? So the, the, again, I'm going to give credit to Diane. Um, she has identified as the authoritative, okay? What's, what do I call the authoritative again? The democratic form of parenting is a major contributor to the field. It's a central concept in understanding socialization in diverse families even. So this works across ethnic groups. Regardless of age, ethnic group, family structure, it is related to positive outcomes. The authoritative parenting style. It parallels the central role of attachment in understanding the emotional aspects, not only of infant-child relationship, but relationships through lifespan. There's some research showing that nature of that avoidant, fearful attachment style, I could get into that, but I won't, actually has an impact on the person you date or you marry. And your expectations in that relationship comes out of your attachment style from your mom or your primary caregiver. Fascinating stuff. Then that, we're talking about the first two to five years. Childhood influences development. Um, authoritative, uh, let me just break it down here, okay? Now this was nursery, but I just want you, this is where it started, but it has expanded beyond that. So it's not just in this particular group. It's gone into elementary and secondary as well. So authoritative parents are attentive to the children's needs and individuality but also have high standards and parents use what? Reasoning and mutually responsive problem solving when there are conflicts. Children are self-reliant and self-confident as a result of that. I can do this. I made a decision. And you foster self-efficacy in that process. I have dignity. My parents show respect for me, which is a big thing for Dobson. Where's the respect that you have for your children? Authoritarian parents have high standards, demanding and control, excuse me, authoritarian, which is what? Autocratic, yes. Have high standards, demanding and controlling without attention to the children's wishes or needs. They emphasize what? Obedience rather than independence. Children are often unhappy, withdrawn, and inhibited. Permissive. Parents set few limits. They accept all the children's impulses, granting freedom without bonds of safety. Parents allow all feelings, even those are, that are angered them. You don't, I'm going to I mean, show you what to do with, with emotions later on. But granting freedom within bonds of safety. Parents allow all feelings, even those that, are angered, that, that have angered them. Parents' anger builds up and sometimes they lash out. Their children were least independent and controlled, best described as immature. And we're going back to what? 
nursery. Nursery. And then following, following them along. So let me dig deeper into the, into the authorita authoritative or, or, or democratic. See rights and duties of parent and child as complementary, not identical, and they change as a function of the child's stage of development. Do you know what a three-year-old should be able to do? Or a six-year-old, nine-year-old? What are they capable of doing, not capable of doing? If we don't have a sense of what a normal developmental stage is, and what, then it's going to be very difficult to parent effectively. If you're trying to get your one-year-old child to be potty trained, good luck. <laughs> Please. You know, one challenge I think is that, you know, in, in, a, in a culture in which, uh, you know, there was extended family around, um, uh, communities were close-knit, um, multiple generations living around yes. each other, you had other people to help you learn these things. And Correct. A lot of uh, parents isolation from everyone else around them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, short of reading Dobson, you know, <laughs> they, they, you know, we used to say, I wish we had Jim Dobson living next to us. <laughs> yes. Uh, but uh, we didn't. And, and we, you know, and, and, but, but short of that, I mean, people, they don't know what is no. normal. No. They're paralyzed. And, and they, and so I just, that's just kind of a statement yeah. and that makes people with your expertise even more important. But you know, it's a real challenge, even within the church. It's, right. You know, that uh, a lot of churches, there's such segregation between what the children are doing and the rest of the... Right. That, that you don't... And, and maybe maybe people don't go to Sunday school. I agree with you yeah. on the Sunday school thing. And so there are, there are few opportunities for children to have influence of other loving parents and they can parents to have that teaching that comes from that. Yeah, the coaching, mentoring. Like, for instance, have... At Central, have we ever had presentation in the nursery what is appropriate for a two-year-old, for the parents? My wife was the nursery director for 17 years. Did she ever do that one time? No. I take responsibility for that. I was one of her helpers for 17 years. I did once, did the two-and-a-half-year-olds once a month and I asked her to fire me once. <laughs> and so I was on probation for 16 years. Um, but I agree with you. Or we may start doing it during adolescent, but do we tell parents, okay, what is the sexual normal development of an adolescent? What's the moral development of an adolescent? What's the uh, cognitive development of an adolescent? Th th these are standard stuff. You can take, take, I encourage you, just get an intro to psych textbook. If you're a parent, get an intro to psych textbook, and it doesn't have to be recent. Get one for a penny or something, and then learn these different developmental stages and models. And it, it really will make a difference so that, okay, can I expect a three-year-old to delay gratification for more than 10 minutes? I, that's that's kind of... There's a lot of parents, <laughs> adults that can't wait. So you got to have that sense of, okay, what is feasible? What is feasible? Um, so, thank you. Parents believe they should be aware of and receptive of the children's needs and views before taking action regarding behavioral change. Before I make a decision, what do I do? consult with my child. How many times were you consulted with your parents before a decision was made? Um, we, but we, we're going, there's, we can do this. We can do this, folks. All right? It's just, if we have a mindset, this, this is what freaked me out. All right? Because I, I never knew when I grew up until Ryan was born 
And then I realized, oh crap, I got to grow up. This thing I'm now responsible for. And someday the Lord is going to hold me accountable and say, Grant, how did you parent Ryan? That freaked me out. Ooh. We will be judged to a certain degree on how we parented our kids. And I, I just like, I, I praise God that I went into psychology. That it was transformative in my life, getting a doctorate, we get a master's in guidance and counseling from MSU and then PhD. And, and I realized there's a whole world of truth out there that we as Christians are not accessing that makes a difference in influencing the world. So, see children as maturing through stages with qualitatively different features. So even though both maybe go through identity, you know girls and boys go through identity formation differently? Did you know that? No. The identity formation Ten, his, with Eric Erickson, by the way, is psychosocial development. He was a, an evangelical. He was a born, he was a Christ follower into his 80s. Um, but he, his research showed identity formation and then you go into relationship. So your identity shapes your relationships in interpersonal for your marriage partner. Girls go identity many times after the relationship. Girls are more defined by relationship than boys are. If you know that, then you can make a, you can adjust for that with your children and not having your boy and your girl have the same set of expectations during adolescence. Fascinating stuff. Gender differences do exist. Maturate processes can be modified or influenced by interactions with socializing agents like parents. And I'm going to put that farther than that. And children's pastors, and youth pastors, and coaches, and uncles and aunts, all of those. How many of you can talk, I mean, some of us had parent, uh, teachers that sometimes were more inv in, invested in our lives than our parents were. And we latched on it. That's why youth pastors are so crucial during identity formation because that's why it just killed me <sighs> during the pandemic and we wouldn't let our youth get together as a group. They had all these clumps everywhere. I'm thinking you're destroying their ability to develop key social skills and identity formation and experiencing someone really loving. I understand why. I'm not going to argue with that, but it just still killed me. Because you don't get a redo during childhood. You don't get to do, okay, we're just going to do this year again. <laughs> we're just going to start over. It, it just, anyway, sidebar. Believes children's ideas of right and wrong change with age. Moral development, Kohlberg, understand that really helps right and wrong, how that changes developmentally. Fascinating stuff. Children's need to be, excuse me, children's needs for restraint change with age also. When should I have the most restraint? When they're young. No. <laughs> no, 18 is, that ship probably sailed. But if I, I, when I, well, I'll say it here. I believe that if you do your homework as a parent up until age 10 or 11, invest, engage, motivate, you will not lose them during adolescence. Okay? It will not be a battle because you've already done what? Established a really neat relationship with each of your children. And so there's nothing to fight against, nothing to rebel against. And then when they do start doing some of that stuff, I used to predict it, okay, this year, you guys will probably do some stupid stuff, <laughs> okay? Because you're adolescents, you think you know it all. All right, just remember, 
If, and I said this, you know, if you're out somewhere drinking, you get drunk, just call me. Okay? I'm not going to beat you up. For I just don't want you, because I know you're going to be stupid. That goes with the territory. And they will say, well, Dad, were you stupid? Yes, I was stupid. I was a teen. That's part of the process. You don't get, eat. anyway. Parents' role is to facilitate growth of competence. Competence. Yeah. Which goes back to the seven goals of. Um, you can read this. I want to. I, I, I need to kind of move forward. But in adolescent years, regardless of sex, ethnic background, socioeconomic status. Authoritative parenting is related to adolescent self-confidence, competence, self-reliance, avoidance of delinquent activity, and general good mood. Regardless of religious orientation. That parenting model works. Works. It probably, that parenting model probably is more effective than the vaccine is. But I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> so authoritative parent, in, in European American Latino families, authoritative parenting is also related to school achievement, but not necessarily to African American or Asian American families. It's an interesting dynamic there. When families divorce or remarry, guess what? Authoritative parenting is related to more effective functioning children. So if the parents split, if they keep doing authoritative parenting, democratic parenting, it is in their best interest. So you can see all these. It works. Palmer found that authoritarian parenting in the African-American group was related to independent, assertive, confident behavior in girls in finding, anticipating later research on ethnic differences. So it, it just, if you have to choose one, I want you to choose three, not neglectful. But start out with which one? Authoritarian. Autocratic. Then shift as quickly as you can to authoritative or democratic. And then later adolescent, start becoming a little bit more or using a permissive style. But you're doing that in the context of a foundation in which you can build on that. OK. Um, Anyway, authoritarian, permissive, don't work, according to her research. So again, with Dobson as well, same thing, does not work. It's not effective. Long term, it is destructive. Sense of discipline, we've already talked about that. Sense of discipline is related to what parenting style? Authoritative, democratic, and that's one of our major goals. So, conclusion and question time. Parenting is the most powerful single institution that affects society. Nothing greater. Right now, guess what percent of children in the United States are being raised in a single parent home? Close, 52. More kids come from single parent homes than yeah that is imagine that what impact that has I'm convinced the United States doesn't have a race issue an ethnic issue it has an absent father issue And I stand by that, and I got tons of research to support that. We would rather blame socioeconomic status, race, gender, and we said, forget the fact that we got most of our kids being raised by a single parent who has lots of work to do, so which means how much investment is there in the child's development. It, it, it's a no-brainer, folks. And then we talk about toxic masculinity. It just, it's destroying our country. So dads have to step up. Oh, what's interesting about dads is the kids that their parents are in prison. Dad's in prison. 
and has contact with the child ends up being better than a child that doesn't have any contact with dad. There are more demands in getting a driver's license, a hunting permit, or starting first grade than those of us becoming parents. Just doing the opposite of your parents is not a good plan. Mm -mm. Parent is not inherent in the genes, and it's not inherent in becoming a Christian. Parenting is the hardest task on earth with the least amount of training and guidance. Can you name something? It's harder to do. When I asked that question in intro to psych class with 70 students, how many want to parent like your parents parented? I may get five, six hands go up, which was more than what was ha happened here. Putting the same effort we put into our careers, into parenting, will transform our children and society in an incredibly positive way. How many hours do you put into your career development? Yeah. What if we put that same energy into parenting? Next week, write out your definition of guilt and shame and also bring your parenting mission statement. I want some of you to share those. And I'm going to close with one research that I fascinated me and I implemented it immediately. They did a massive study of what is the difference between those kids that become delinquent and get in juvie, juvenile detention and jail versus those that don't get in trouble and become successful. They looked at everything, socioeconomic status, race, gender, education, and they came up with the, the non-delinquent kids, their parents would go on vacation at least once a year. With them. No. No. Can you imagine that? Just, yeah, we all want vacations with our kids. Yes, that's another subject. That's another, that's marriage enhancement, and, and I can talk about that too. However, for our kids' sake, one simple vacation and it didn't have to be massive it could take the tent to a campground somewhere for two or three days it didn't have to be okay let's go to cancun for a week guess what the underlying mechanism of that is not just spending time but what's the meta message behind doing that exactly exactly you have worth and value, you're important to me, and I want to do something special. And we're going to do it every year. So every year, for a full week, we went somewhere. And I remember my parents did this, and I had no idea that they really were doing it right. <laughs> but every time I came home from boarding school, they took off that first week, and we went somewhere and did something. Always doing vacations with them. And, and, that, that's, and so that, I remember that was my 10th anniversary, somewhere around there, and, and we just said, Rita, we got to take the boys somewhere, <laughs> you know. It's going to cost, but it is worth it. And it doesn't have to cost a lot. All right. Any final comment, thought, reaction? Explain the mission statement again. Okay. Is that our goal for what we want our kids to look like? That is correct. Okay. That is your goal. That's your mission statement of how you are going to parent your children and what you expect and how it's going to guide you. My wife is going to ask whether that last study was funded by KOA. And <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Or, or Hilton or something. Yeah.
Yes. Um, you know, it, it, I, I wonder if you'd have a comment to say about um, with those, you know, one parent is going to lean more toward one area than another area mm -hmm. of those four parenting styles. It can be that way, yes. And how, um, how, uh, how, let's see, uh, it, 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 those studies, do they have to do with the overall parenting style if you sort of averaged out the two parents? Or what if you have a home in which, um, uh, in which one parent uh, is more has made uh, authoritative and the other one is an authoritarian? Or, or permissive. You know, permissive. Yeah. And I, I think that's one question I have is um, uh, thoughts you have or observations you have on that situation. I don't have a good answer in the sense of how they measured, but, but it was more, I do know this, it would be a general, they're filling out the form questionnaire as a couple. As a couple. Yeah. So even that, though, even though there could be some variations between the two, and there will more likely will be variations. And that's probably one of the first things that you, first developmental task almost, after you had your first child is, okay, we have to figure out a way how we're both going to be on the same page in parenting. And there's no doubt, clearly Rita was more permissive and I was more, I want to say authoritative, but I was more authoritarian at first. Um, and what helped me was recognizing, oh, my clients, what they went through in their childhood. So how did you two work through some of those natural differences? Uh, we talked. We t they saw the benefit and the outcome from it. And a few times, not often, I would pull rank, and that's not fair, but I would, I say, sweetheart, if I was a medical doctor and I said you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that, you would probably kind of acquiesce. I need you to trust me on this one. Didn't happen often, but every so often I would say, I know what I'm doing. I know, and, and you've got a mom's heart, praise God for your mom's heart, um, because the boys turned out well, more because they're probably Rita than me. Um, she, she went to all their ball games. She would drive to their away games. Um, not everyone can do that. Um, but she clearly, but yeah, I agree with you. Parents have to present a united front. Do not fight over the kids in front of your kids. Don't do that. You do want to model how to resolve conflict, but that's different than fighting. They need to see how mom and dad negotiate differences. Great question. All right, I know i got to stop here. Thank you all very much. I'm going to close in prayer. And if you have any questions after this, just let me know. Uh, I'll, please, my, my email, I would be glad to answer any questions. But... Grant Jones, PhD at gmail.com. I will respond to any and all questions. I'm not afraid of truth because truth sets people free. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me close in prayer. Lord, thank you that you are a father and we are your children. And you love it <laughs> that we have this relationship with you. And I don't want to make too much of it, but it's nice to know that I got a brother, Jesus who understands what it's like to be a human being. I got the best of both worlds, and I thank you for that. I thank you for every person here, Lord. I, I please do something very special in his or her life that even this week the children will see a difference and the parenting plan will start emerging into something that is transformative and lasting. Be the Lord of our lives, Lord. Yes, but be the Lord of our families as well and our marriages. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. 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 Blessings, everybody. Thank you for coming. Hope to see you again next week.